If you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to Luke chapter 2. I'd like for you to add uh, Art, Robert's Art, if you don't mind raising your hand there just a little bit. His wife, Jean, passed away this last week, and uh, so please lift uh, he and his family up in prayer. Some of you expressed concern about Frank. He seemed to be winded up here on the stage. Uh, <laughs> we're going to get him on an exercise fitness program this week. Uh, man, his age, you never know. You just never know. Luke chapter 2, everything has a purpose and a function in our Creator's universe, and we're never going to fully understand this side of heaven, uh, why every object or living being is made the way it is, the, the parts of each object and living being, or why everything happens at the time it does. There's a reason why every place, every person, Every color, every animal, every date is included in the story of God's entrance into our human existence. And as Frank mentioned earlier, we're going to focus our messages this December on the colors of Christmas. Because of the death of a loved one or the pain of a divorce, Christmas can sometimes be a lonely time. Others are saddened during this time of year, maybe by the loss of a job or the constant reminder as they look in their house of a tornado's destruction, or the harsh reality that in their family there isn't enough money to pay the heating bill or the mortgage payment to buy food, let alone purchase presents. And we want to think of Christmas as a happy time, a time of celebrating with family, the birth of, of Jesus Christ. But I got to tell you, for some people, Christmas is a blue time. Now. Uh, for those who, maybe this applies, uh, I just want to let you know that we do have grief share every Tuesday night. Um, for those who have lost a loved one, we're starting this month uh, divorce care. For those who are going through the emotions uh, that accompany a divorce, and there are brochures by each of the doors, including down by the chapel, that have to do with that. You know, there are churches in America that offer blue Christmas services to help those who are dealing with grief and pain and sorrow. According to Richard Spencer of Trinity Church in Ossining, New York, Blue Christmas services are about, quote, bringing the light of Christmas into the darkness of people's lives. Mark Hangler of St. Mark's Episcopal Church in Durango, Colorado says his purpose for the Blue Christmas service is to, quote, acknowledge people's pain and loss and offer some sense of relief and hope. You know, you could argue that the very first Christmas was a blue Christmas. The first Christmas was about a teenage girl who is pregnant with a child that is not her husband's, who then gives birth to a boy in a dirty animal stall. It's about uh, innocent boys who are killed by King Herod and two parents who have to flee to another country because of Herod's insecurities. You know, there are times all, in all of our lives when things just seem blue. And God's revelation to some shepherds near Bethlehem 2,000 years ago is still encouraging people today. So I'm going to begin re reading from verse 8 of Luke chapter 2. I know it's a familiar passage of Scripture, but if you're like me, every time we get into the Bible, there's just something we, we notice, we see that maybe we missed the time before. So Luke 2, verse 8, that night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the one who is the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, glory to God in highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried to the village, and they found Mary and Joseph. And there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the, the shepherds told everyone 
what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. And all who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. And it was just as the angel had told them it would be. So if you have your, if you'll take out the bulletin from there inside of, uh, or the outline, I'm sorry, from inside of your bulletin, because a savior was born, the angel was saying in verse 11, our sins are forgiven. Many people are afraid of the dark. I, I was that way when I was growing up. So the prospect of protecting sheep from predators or, or uh, robbers on a dark hillside at night is not an assignment too many people would sign up for. And I gotta tell you, having been there, these are not hills. These are many mountains. And the sheep had to be protected from Israel's neighbors because from time to time, they would come in and steal flocks and steal from the Israelites' fields. Shepherds were also the first line of defense against wild animals. At that time, there would have been lions and bears and hyenas and wolves and jackals. And so a shepherd's ears were trained to pick up any sound different from the occasional bleating of sheep. You know, if we put ourselves in that position, I don't know how you are, but there are times when you hear noises in the dark and you think, what was that? Particularly if you're in a new place. And if I'm in, there on the hillside, I'm not going to get a whole lot of sleep in that kind of situation, knowing what was all around me, what my responsibility was, were. But shepherds were trained, just like soldiers are trained. A shepherd knew what sounds are not normal at night and which sounds were out of the ordinary. A shepherd knew his sheep by name. A shepherd was committed to his sheep. And shepherds knew there were a lot of different problems and they would anticipate and train how to respond to those problems. But there are some things that happen to all of us which are very difficult to anticipate. So when an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared among them in their midst and the radiance of the Lord's glory blinded their eyes, the Bible says these trained shepherds were terrified. And I understand. They had never seen anything like this before. This was nowhere near addressed in their shepherd's manual. And just as suddenly, just as unexpectedly as the angel first appeared to them, he now talks directly to them don't be afraid. And they're thinking, yeah, right. Don't be afraid. I have good news that will bring great joy to all people. You have a Savior. And he was born tonight in Bethlehem. Go check him out. That's my paraphrase, if you will. Go see him. The color of blue appears primarily in the Old Testament, and when it does, blue is often associated with the subject of the law or the commandments. The Israelites were to attach blue tassels to their clothing so that whenever they saw these blue tassels, they were to be reminded to obey the commands of the Lord, the law of the Lord, rather than chasing after other gods and idols. The color of blue is also frequently mentioned when describing fabric colors and decorations in the tabernacle and then later in the temple. There was one person who always wore blue, and that was the high priest who came once a year into the Holy of Holies to offer a blood sacrifice on behalf of the Israelite people. Now we read throughout the book of Hebrews in the New Testament that Jesus Christ is now our high priest. Centuries after the law was first given, Paul would write, when the time was just right, God sent forth his son who was born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were living under the law. And so when Jesus came, Jesus said, 
Do not think that I have come to abolish the law. I did not come to abolish the teachings of the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them, to obey them in all of their completeness. And consequently, Isaiah said, Jesus, or or the Messiah, he was despised. He was rejected by man. He took our pain. He bore our suffering. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed because of our iniquities. And consequently, the punishment that you and I deserve for the sins that we have all committed were laid upon Jesus. And now, because Jesus bore those sins for us, we have peace with God. When Jesus Christ died, he went into the Holy of Holies as our high priest, figuratively dressed in the blue robe of a a life given in perfect obedience to the law. Jesus took with him into the Holy of Holies, not the blood of an animal, but his own blood. And unlike the high priest under the old covenant, Jesus' blood did not simply roll over our sins from one year to the next year. Jesus' blood forgave us of our sins for all time. And in doing so, Jesus brought us to peace with God. Jesus brought us into a relationship with God. In the year 2005, somebody at the Ridgeway Elementary School in Dodgeville, Wisconsin, came up with this politically correct idea to have a winter program instead of a Christmas program. And everybody knows you can't have Jesus in a public school Christmas program, right? Or, I'm sorry, winter program. And some bright individual came up with this idea to use the tune of Silent Night in the winter program, but to change the words and call it cold in the night. Seriously. <clears throat> went something like this. Cold in the night, no one in sight. Winter storms whirl and bite. How I wish I were happy and warm and with my family out of the storm. Seriously. I'm sure it didn't sound that good, but that's what they were thinking. <laughs> A public outrage and a threatened lawsuit convinced the school to sing Silent Night and other traditional Christmas carols instead. But seriously, what peace is there if we take Jesus Christ out of the Christmas story? I mean, what hope is there if we take Jesus Christ out of the Christmas story? Our family just celebrated Thanksgiving, as I'm sure that many of your families did as well. It was God, we thanked, for the many blessings that he has given to us this last year. Our family will celebrate Christmas, as I'm sure your family will as well. It will be God whose birth and entrance into this human world we rejoice in, we celebrate. What I'm saying is, without God, there really isn't anything to be thankful or hopeful about. And Christmas is the celebration that however blue our lives may be from whatever is going on, God has great news for us. Our sins are forgiven. Our relationship with God can be restored. And as a result, our present is secured. This world can be tough at times, I know that. We all go through those tough times. We've all had them. Loved ones die. Close friends move away. People suffer with sickness, sometimes long-term. Families lose their homes. Evil threatens our safety. Evil people hurt innocent people. But the message repeated throughout the Christmas story is this. Listen, do not be afraid. In fact, it's, it's throughout the whole story. When the angel told Zechariah that he would be the father of John the Baptist, the one who would precede the Messiah and prepare God's people for the Messiah, the angel said to Zechariah, do not be afraid, your prayer has been answered. When the angel told Mary that she was pregnant with God's son, the angel said, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. When the angel told Joseph that God was the one who was responsible for Mary's pregnancy, the angel said, do not be afraid, Joseph, to take Mary home and be your wife. And now in our text, 
the angel appears to the shepherds and says, do not be afraid, I bring you good news. And that theme runs consistent throughout Jesus' ministry. In Matthew chapter 8, the disciples were crossing <clears throat> the Sea of Galilee. When Jesus fell asleep in the boat, you know he had to be tired, right? He falls asleep, and when this intense storm comes up, and, and having been there on the Sea of Galilee, you can see how it's configured. There are mountains here on, on, on the uh, southern side, and winds can come through those mountains and down on the sea, and a storm can come up suddenly. And when this intense storm brought water splashing into the boat, Jesus' disciples woke their master up, we're gonna drown. Can't you do something? Now they had seen what Jesus was capable of doing before. And yet Jesus still had to ask them, why are you afraid? So Jesus calmed the wind and he calmed the waves. And it happened again in Matthew chapter 14. But this time, Jesus was not with his disciples. And so around 3 a.m. in the morning when the wind is howling and the waves were crashing, Jesus' disciples look out and they see what looked like a man walking on the water there on the waves in the midst of the storm. It's a ghost, some cried out. And the words of encouragement that Jesus spoke to them are the same words of encouragement that Jesus encourages us with today when we're in the midst of our storms. Don't be afraid. Take courage. Well, why? How? I am here. There is no need to be afraid when Jesus is near. In this world, Jesus said, you will experience troubles, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And because Jesus has overcome the world, we can overcome the world as well. Jesus promises, I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. Therefore, Paul concluded, because Jesus is always with me to the end of time, I can deal with any mess. I can conquer any problem through Christ who gives me strength. What lies behind us and what lies before us are small matters compared to who lies within us. Jesus Christ. The psalmist nailed it. When he said, because the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything that I need. Before Jesus bodily left the disciples, he gave them this promise, and in doing so, he gives us the same promise. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. I'm going to give you a peace, the likes of which the world can, cannot give you, the likes of which the world cannot even begin to understand. What did the angel say? This baby boy's name would be Emmanuel. What does that mean? God with us. Because Jesus Christ is right there with us in the midst of our storms, he can bring us the same calm, the same peace he brought the disciples 2,000 years ago in the midst of their storms. Just before Easter of 2009, Fred Winters, pastor's a pastor of the First Baptist Church in Maryville, Illinois, was shot and killed during a Sunday morning service by a disturbed young man. Tragedy shook the community and the church and the family, but it didn't destroy their faith. The next week, the newly widowed Cindy Winters was interviewed on a national television broadcast and when asked about her husband's killer, she said, and I quote, I do not have any hatred or even hard feelings toward him. We have been praying for him. One of the thir first things my daughter said to me after this happened was, you know, I hope that he comes to learn to love Jesus through all of this. Cindy Winters concluded, and I quote, we are not angry at all. And we firmly believe that he can find forgiveness and peace through this by coming to know Jesus. We sincerely hope that happens for him. 
we too can know Jesus' joy even in the midst of our storms. Even in the midst of our troubles, we have hope. And I dare say this morning, you know somebody. You know a family member, a neighbor, a coworker, a classmate. You know somebody who needs hope. It may be you. Somebody who needs joy this year, this time. If you know somebody like that, could you just lift your hand? Let me see. Just raise your hand. Yeah. I'm going to say a prayer, and and I want you to lift up silently the name of that person while we're praying. Heavenly Father, uh, you you know in, in your abundant wisdom and knowledge, you know the names of every person that that we're lifting up to you right now, and and you're able to sort through each one of them. In fact, you know every one of them. You already know their needs. You already know the issues they're going through. So we are asking collectively that you would plant a desire in their hearts to seek you. Yeah, maybe even this year, this December, there would be something that, a question they might ask us a spiritual question. Perhaps they even desire to come to church with us. I don't know, but God, we pray that they would find your good news soon. And we're going to thank you in advance for answering our prayers on their behalf. In Jesus' name, amen. I got to tell you, God does some of his greatest work where? In the midst of our darkness when times are are hard. In fact, despite the persecutions and the hardships that Paul faced, probably more and greater than any of us will ever face, Paul says we know that all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. I dare say all of us can look at times and things and problems in our past and think, oh man, at the time, oh, what was going on? I can't believe that. What was the wisdom? What was the purpose of that? And then later, look back and see God's hand in the midst of it. Our present is secure because of what we face and Jesus with us. We need not be afraid of anything. Because our sins are forgiven, our present is secure, and one more thing here, our future is assured. What if we had no idea where we were going to sleep tonight? What if we had no guarantee that we would have a home to return to. Sometimes for reasons that we can't comprehend, there are many in that very situation. This last week I was in a prayer group with preachers and a lady walks in. All she wanted was $20. She's living in her car. She can't drive it because she's lost her driver's license. So it's sitting in an abandoned lot. She lives in her car with her two cats and her two dogs. And she has a propane heater beside the car to heat the car. All she wanted was $20 for propane. Whatever our situation may be right now, However blue life may seem to us right now, I got to tell you, Jesus is there. And he will help us if we turn to him. And furthermore, nothing and no one can take away the glorious future Jesus has has in store for us. In Christ, we know where we are going to spend eternity. Unfortunately, not everybody knows that. Elvis Presley always wore a Christian cross, a star of David, and the Hebrew letter chi, which stands for life. And and I think he was serious when he said, and I quote, I don't want to miss out on heaven due to a technicality. He wanted to cover every base. 
In June of 2006, Warren Buffett announced that he would donate 85% of his $44 billion fortune to five charitable foundations. When questioned about his generosity, Buffett stated, and I quote, there's more than one way to get to heaven, but this is a great way. I guess he thought he could buy his way into heaven. In June of 2008, an 80-year-old widow from India spent $37,500 on a feast for 100,000 people there in India, hoping it would, it would please the gods and open the door of heaven for her. The good news, the angel brought the shepherds 2,000 years ago who were living out under the stars with hardly a penny to their name assured them of a mansion in heaven. And in spite of what this widow from India hoped for, in spite of what Warren Buffett thinks, and in spite of all of the precautions that Elvis Presley took, heaven is a free gift from God for all people who simply accept what Jesus has done for us. So a Sunday school teacher was trying to drive that point home with his class. Nothing we can do can get heaven or, or, or access into heaven. It's all about what Jesus has done for us. He says to the class, if I sold my house and my car and I had a big garage sale and I gave all my money to the church, would that get me into heaven? No. Great. If I clean the church every day, mowed the yard, kept everything neat and tidy, would that get me into heaven? Again, the class, no. What if I was kind to animals, gave candy to kids, and, and loved my wife? Would that get me into heaven? Again, emphatically, they all said, no. He thought, I got them. <laughs> they know the answer. Thinking he had successfully taught them this important truth on God's grace, he then asked the class. He was certain he was certain would produce the answer that he was looking for. Well, then how can I get to heaven? And a five-year-old boy shouted out, you got to die. You got to be dead. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> and yet that's so true, is it not? Jesus took away the sting of death. Death is what we have to go through here to get there. D.L. Moody was a great evangelist, and thousands of people found their way to heaven because of his preaching. And as he approached the end of his life, Moody viewed heaven as something we all should anticipate, something we all should look forward to. And he said, and I'm quoting him here, someday you will read in the newspapers that D.L. Moody is dead. Don't believe a word of it. At that moment, I shall be a lot more alive than I am right now. I shall have left this temporary fleshly body for my permanent home. I was born in the flesh in 1837. I was born again by the Spirit in 1856. That which is born of the flesh will someday die. That which is born of the Spirit will live forever. Brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to believers who have died so you will not grieve like people who have no hope. You see, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Faith is the confidence in what we hope for, the assurance of what we do not yet see. The message the shepherds heard 2,000 years ago, the first ones to hear it is this, death no longer has power over us. Jesus Christ gives us victory over sin and death. That's great news. <laughs> now you know why they were so excited. In 2015, the Hillcor Corporation, a Houston-based oil and gas company, presented every one of their nearly 1,400 employees, uh, listen to me, 1,400 employees, gave them a Christmas bonus of, and you're sitting down, $100,000 a piece. When Jeff Hildebrand founded the company, he was determined to build it on the concept that every person in the company was important to the company's growth. And so employees are regularly solicited for their ideas. Five years earlier, <laughs> in 2010, the employees were able to choose between a, a $50,000 automobile or $35,000 in cash as a Christmas bonus. I mean, they don't have a hard time keeping employees, you know what I'm saying? And I know what you're thinking. 
We need to have that kind of a Christmas bonus incentive here at New Hope. I know. That's what, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> a receptionist named Amanda Thompson echoed what most of the employees felt, and, and, and she said, and I quote, it is impossible to give less than 100% in such an environment. If I know that I have an inheritance beyond this life that is far greater than anything I have ever seen, anything I've ever heard about, or anything I can even begin to comprehend in my mind, and if I knew that such an existence would last forever, would it not create within me a longing to go home? This is the good news of great joy that angel had for all people. This is the good news that angel first revealed to the shepherd some 2,000 years ago. Knowing the kind of life that I can have in Jesus, the life I do have in Jesus, knowing what my life was like before Jesus, knowing the kind of bonus that I have yet coming in the life beyond, is there any logical reason why I or any of us would not give more than 100% to the one who has made it possible, Jesus Christ? (laughs) That's the good news. That's why the shepherds went around telling everybody, and that's why we need to go around telling everybody too.